Joseph here and today we are discussing the risky. It is indeed a risky exam. I know many people that got through finals by a hairline because they maybe passed by 0.5% or 1% on the risky. I think often because it's a relatively easy exam compared to the SBA, the single best answer paper, or the clinical exams, and so people don't really give it the attention that it deserves. Unfortunately as well, it is relatively redundant because it's a physical written prescribing exam under different names and different unis with papers and forms that are usually digitized by now in most hospitals, but we're examined on it, so we have to learn it. Um, it is an acronym, nobody knows what it stands for, but here we go. So, first of all, top tips for the risky. The prep time, the minimum time that you need to prepare for the risky is three days. I think that is cutting it fine if I was you, but um, if you just pay attention to the forms that you have been faced with throughout the years, then you'll at least be familiar with them. And I think the worst thing is not being familiar with something and ending up missing some of the fields on the paper and missing out on crucial marks. In some universities, it is a combined score with the PSA, so the Prescribing Skills Assessment, um, and so you do need to perform well on both or compensate on one if you did poorly in the other one. The general template for risky papers in general or risky questions is that you have demographics, so the time that it's taken and the time that it's reported, and then bullet points as to the clinical information that you're given. Very, most of the time it's you're given the clinical information in an uncoded format and you simply have to code it into the relevant document. Then you give your impression, your plan, and remember the patient details are critically important. So sometimes they might give false details or something that requires double checking. Um, so don't just blindly copy things over with this paper. A few prescribing tips. So for morphine and breakthrough dose, remember your rules for um, breakthrough doses of pain, of pain control, so a tenth to a sixth of the background dose. And then if it's uncontrolled, you can add breakthrough to the baseline, but don't exceed 50%. Some useful pages in the BNF. So on the topic of pain control, we have opioid conversion. You are given a physical BNF in the paper. So page 24 of the current version has the opioid conversion chart and the FP10 example is helpfully written out in page nine. There is also um, the trick of looking for phrases so if you're looking for gonorrhea it may not be i mean don't don't ever look for gonorrhea but if if that's in if it's not in the bnf you might have to look for antibacterial therapy sexually transmitted infections and so on so it is often a case of kind of thinking how can i paraphrase what i'm looking for here is it under pneumonia or is it under respiratory tract infection and just get used to seeing what things are typically saved under so that you're not spending ages flipping through those tiny thin papers pages for the BNF. Also remember that if you are given an instruction to um, prescribe for someone who's just had a stroke and they haven't had their swallow assessed, then no oral drugs until it is assessed. So you might have to go for IV, subcutaneous or some other route. If a patient comes in and they have existing drugs on the Cardex, then you want to add any drugs that they had on admission into the Cardex unless they are contraindicated, unless they are in AKI for example. So use your clinical reasoning for this paper. Generally, they won't make you make too many clinical jumps of diagnostic reasoning. Um, it will be quite straightforward stuff, but just keep an eye out for it. This is a very time pressured exam, and it's very easy to slip up when they give you naughty uh, distractions like this. For example, we have John Price, John Price, Jan Price, John Price. And if you're not looking carefully, you might prescribe the wife's gabapentin onto the husband's drug chart and then you've made a major drug error. So watch out for that stuff. Finally, there are killer marks for the risky. So the killer mark is, for example, if you got the NHS number wrong, or if you didn't copy the name over, or if you um, missed something in the date, or that something in the beginning of the question, that can mean that you end up getting no marks for any subsequent questions, any subsequent marks for the rest of that question and that can really drop your grade by 5% or 10%, and it can be a real killer. So watch out for that stuff. Make sure, if even if you have no idea what's going on with the question, get the demographics down first. So that's it for the top tips for the risky. Now let's go through the various types of question that you're gonna get. The first one is the Cardex. So 
this is the most typical thing and this is how a card deck should look when it's filled out. So remember, circle the time and you can even tick the box next to that, the narrower box. That's really just belt and braces. It may not be necessary, but the box is there. So just to indicate that it is a twice daily dose, for example, and you've ticked it on both sides. Type the drug in the approved name, so not the commercial name, try and include the full, full name for that. And then remember, dose, root, frequency. You then have the start date, signature, and your full name. If you're discontinuing the drug, remember to write in the notes the date that it's discontinued, cross it out on the, or cross out the, uh, the line on the, on the appropriate date, and write suspend for whatever, so for AKI, for example. In the question, you remember you need to write out all of the prescriptions that the patient has and then withhold the relevant ones with maybe a note saying review on X date. And again, the timing for review depends on what the drug is and how long the course has been prescribed for and what the reason that you're withholding the drug is. Again, it'll be clinically quite simple cases. <coughs> so. Um, final thing, and can often get caught out by, is if you're prescribing something like coamoxiclav, 500-125 is 625 milligrams in total. You can always check the BNF if you are unsure, but it is a waste of time in that exam. I remember with this paper actually running up until the very last second when they're trying to collect the papers in for, for this one. So... Um, there's not much time to sit and gaze at the stars. <coughs> the FP10. So this is the primary care prescribing sheet. And this is an example of how you would prescribe something. Remember, if it is a controlled drug, you need to write the number in numbers and in words, as you, as you see here. If you struggle with this, or if you're not sure which number is supposed to be in words, is it meant to be the dose or the, or the number of tablets or whatever, just write them all in words. So write number and then words in brackets, and then that's made sure that you're safe for that. Also, there is a, an example in the BNF of a controlled drug prescription on an FP10. So if you completely forget, you can always check that. So the general structure, remember, dose, drug, root, frequency. So we have the preparation and the quantity. This is the extra detail that you need in an FP10 compared to a Cardex, where you have to say how many tablets to provide over a certain amount of time. 14 days is the typical, but it may be that depending on the patient's context, that it's over a shorter or a longer period. You may also need to include the actual dispensing instructions as well. So check the um, medicinal information on the BNF and if it's only available in 10 milligram and 20 milligram tablets and you have to prescribe 30 milligrams, then you will need to specifically write that out for controlled drugs. Then you've included the dose, the indication, so take one tablet, 30 milligrams every evening for pain, and then to draw a line underneath the end of your prescriptions and write no more items on this prescription. Something that is easy to forget is this line here about the number of days that the drug is uh, is given for. But check the example, make sure you've filled in all the gaps. And also on the bottom, you actually have a field for the address of the um, surgery. So um, make sure that you fill that in. That's something that, that I, I forgot on the day. Okay, next is insulin chart. So general things to remember, device. So C is cartridge, that's the most common, um, but it may advise you to give something specific in the question. If it's an inpatient, you may need to increase by roughly 10%. That's the rule of thumb. Your trust may have different guidelines for that. And also to add to the Cardex as well. So if a patient is on insulin and they have a Cardex too, you may need to write insulin and then say as per insulin chart um, within there and say refer to other charts. So on the front page of the Cardex, you have uh, any other charts in use, you say insulin chart. So this is what the standard insulin chart looks like. So page one, you need to include the specific type of insulin, so Humulin 1, with the start date, the hospital, the date of admission, the frequency, um, and to be safe, write the frequency in words. Don't write BD, um, just in case you have a stickler for, a, for someone marking your paper. 
Again, the examples are given in words here, so I think better to stick to the convention that is given on the sheets that you're given. Um, patient demographics, prescriber's signature, and date. Page two, this is where you match the frequency, so you, you simply write in the results of the capillary blood glucose um, and the dose that's given and any adjustments needed to be given day to day as you go through. So insulin chart, relatively straightforward. They will not expect you to wing it with insulin doses. They will provide a snippet of guideline or some kind of um, flow chart or process that you have to follow for that. Next, we have fluids. So remember, patient demographics, as many bits of information as you're given in the question. And then um, there are many rules to fluids. So I'm not going to cover all of that myself, but um, in general, you might be asked to prescribe a relevant bolus dose or a maintenance dose, in which case the rule of thumb is saline plus the, or, or the, you say, sodium and potassium one millimole per kilogram. So if the patient is 80 kilograms, they would need 80 millimoles of potassium and 80 millimoles of sodium per 24 hours. And you split that over the, the necessary time. One thing to remember is no more than 10 millimoles of potassium per hour. KCL. KCL and NACL are appropriate abbreviations for fluid charts. Um, and remember that potassium only comes in 20 millimole bags as well. So um, you can't prescribe 35 millimoles of potassium or whatever, because it, it wouldn't be practical to actually administer that. Um, as it always comes pre-mixed in the bags, we no longer add potassium um, manually in a, from a vial because of the, uh, the obvious risk there. Next, we have urinalysis. This one's quite easy. So if you get this kind of question, it'll be a gift. Basically, the general structure is demographic, appearance, interpretation, impression, and plan. So remember, across the top, patient demographics, hospital information, date and time, and then just write out what is your name as the F1 doctor, what you've performed, so urine dipstick, what was the indication for doing so, and then what is your interpretation? What does the urine look like, which they'll describe in the question, followed by what are the dipstick results for each particular answer. Remember to circle the answer that was um, abnormal within that, uh, within that question. And then at the end, you can give an impression. So in this case, it's cloudy urine, the patient is febrile, it is most likely to be a urinary tract infection. And then you can write a brief plan. It doesn't have to be a, a super in-depth plan, just something like this would be, would be fine. Um, there may or may not be a specific indication for antibiotic in there. Also remember to sign off by your um, bleep number, possibly GMC number if you want to be really safe, and your signature as well. Next we have ECG reporting. This is a bit of a tough one because there is a lot going on with an ECG interpretation, but remember, as always, there are a lot of marks for simply demographics and just describing what's there. So we go through demographic, when was it taken, when was it reported, and what was the paper speed? All on the paper, just copying over. Then look at the rate. So atrial and ventricular rhythm, uh, these may be different, so look at the P waves and look at the QRS complexes, then figure out the rate by doing the, the squares formulas. Rhythm, is it regular, is it irregular, is it irregularly irregular or not, and what is the axis if there's any deviation there. You then just simply go through each of the waves section by section. It shouldn't be something too crazy like torsade de point or something, but um, in general, you get most of the marks just by describing what you're seeing without necessarily having to know what it is. Don't make the mistake of seeing it and being like, right, it's a STEMI, and then just writing it and leaving it at that. You will not get as many marks as if you go through and you, you describe the PR interval. What is the length? Is it prolonged? Is it fixed? Is there one before every QRS complex? How wide is the QRS complex? And are there any abnormalities in it? Is it slurred or um, any other waves that you're seeing? What's the QT segment? Remember, less than 450 milliseconds is normal. And what are, th are there any ST changes as well? Um, so even if there aren't, you can just state that so that you look like you're going systematically through each of the parts of an ECG. Talk about any T-wave inversion if you see that. And then 
discuss your impression based on that. If you're not sure, you can just say impression, not sure, we'll seek senior review. Next, we have requesting imaging. So um, with this, the key template is to include, as always, your patient demographics at the top, date of birth, patient number, and who the consultant is, what the ward was and whether they came in on a trolley or a bed or whatever. Are they pregnant? <clears throat> so that should have a tick next to no. Um, and when was their last menstrual period? Um, this man is male actually, so he doesn't need a doesn't need to specify whether he's pregnant, but no harm in saying that he's not. Um, so yes, you describe the relevant clinical information. Some stuff about the background, there are often quite a few more marks than I expected for the clinical information. So you want to say, what are the symptoms? What's his brief background? So he's post-surgery. Um, in, indicate that you think you know what's going on by saying, well, there's no bowel movements and he's had vomiting. It could be a bowel obstruction. So query what it is. And then when you're requesting the imaging or the examination, specify the body part. Don't just write radiograph or x-ray. Say abdominal x-ray, really spell it out. And then finally, sign off with your name, your grade, which will be F1 for the purpose of the exam in most cases, signature and date. And then you can put in your bleep number as well, which I have forgotten to do on this example. So a final thing, mention if it's postpartum and try and stick with simple stuff. Um, usually they won't be asking you to request an MRCP or an ERCP unless they say specifically in the question. News chart. So this, again, is just about copying data over from one thing to another. The main thing to remember is that you put in a cross um, rather than a dot. And for blood pressure, you just do a line between the two. You count up the points. You write out what the total news score is. And job is a good one. Chest x-ray. We always want to have a framework for any kind of free text answer in the risky. So in this case, we have, again, demographics, hospital information, um, who you are, date, time, what's been happening. So it's a chest X-ray and why was it performed? Without having to know anything about the chest X-ray, even if you're looking at it and thinking, I've got no idea what that is, don't panic. Remember that you've got all of that stuff in place. You've got many marks already in the back. And actually, if you missed any of those things and you go straight on to trying to interpret some advanced feature of the chest x-ray, then you may well have lost all of those marks anyway from missing something in the demographics. So I know I'm repeating myself, but this is so important because you just see it so often of people that missed that and ended up completely screwing up the whole question. So the method that I use is A to I, so airway, bones, cardiac silhouette, diaphragm, edges of heart, fields of lung, gastric bubble, hyalur regions, instruments. Um, you can, there's, there's many other ones that people use. I think I've seen Dr. ABC, um, RIP, ABC or something. Um, whichever one works for you, whichever one you remember the most, doesn't really matter because as long as you're being systematic and you're covering everything that you see in the chest X-ray, then you are fine. <clears throat> so here's an example that I've done. Just basically indication followed by something about the image quality, so rotation, inspiration, and penetration and then talk about the main abnormality first, rather than trying to hide it among your, your um, framework. Then you can go through your framework. You don't need to be writing in complete prose with grammatically beautiful stuff. You can just put bullet points, airway bones, cardiac silhouette, etc. At the end, impression, this is likely a right low zone pneumonia, plan, basic stuff, sepsis six, empirical antibiotics, sputum culture, senior review. Sign it off, bleep number, maybe GMC number if you want, and signature. There are some buzzwords you can use. Make sure that you have a look on Radiopedia, great resource um, for the key buzzword for each um, main pathology in the lungs, for example. So things like reticular nod nodular shadowing, cavitating lesions, multifocal opacification. These all relate to specific conditions. And then if you are asked to check the placement of an NG tube. This is something that I was I was asked in my risky. The key points are, is it in the midline? Does it bisect the carina in the midline, the point of bifurcation of the 
bronchioles, the, the bronchus, and is the tip visible below the diaphragm? If it's not any of those things, you need to specify that it is not safe to feed and what the plan is, in which case it would be do not feed, remove the NG tube, replace, check again, try aspirating, and if they're still unable to, then you may need to consider a patch for certain drugs like Parkinson's medication. So x-ray of a joint, similar process. So we have um, the method that I use is just ABCS <coughs> for joints. So demographic, as always, what time is it taken? What time is it reported? What's the indication for the image? What is it a picture of? So is it a hand or a wrist? Which hand is it? This was very similar to the um, one that we had in our exam. And what's the image quality like? So we had, I think, a um, displaced radial fracture. And you had to talk about the angle of displacement and so on. In the question that I had, they actually gave you a framework to walk through, but you don't want to rely on that. You may just be given a question saying, interpret this image, in which case you're on your own, you need to have your own framework to use. So ABCS stands for alignment, which is anatomical integrity and any contours. What is Shenton's line, for example, in the hip X-ray, or are there any other lines um, or continuity of structures that you would expect to see in a joint? Then look at the bone. So are there any abnormalities of the bone, such as enlargements, radiolucency, osteophytes? Comment on um, the different structures that you see as well. So if it's a hip, then just all of the main anatomical structures in there. So the pelvic ring, the obturator foramina, the sacrum, the acetabula, um, and the femoral shafts as well. And if, if you can see any loss of joint space, for example. If there's a fracture, then remember that orthopedic surgeons get paid. So patient anatomy, intra or extra articular and deformity. C stands for cartilage or cortex. So, <coughs> excuse me, this is where we look for uh, loss of joint space, any kind of small fractures or an erosion. Remember to learn the different types of fractures as well um, to get an extra mark in terms of being able to classify what the fracture is, whether it's kind of a, a green stick or a transverse or oblique or whatever. Soft tissue. So we want to look for swelling, tissue loss, foreign bodies or calcification. Um, this might be more obvious in, say, a abdominal or a pelvic x-ray where you might see calcification near the kidneys or um, a foreign body up the bum or um, something like that. So um, we want to look out for those things as well as the soft tissue of like the psoas muscle, for example, which may be visible. Impression, you might have to write something like the this x-ray shows degenerative changes consistent with osteoarthritis of the left hip. So those are some examples of the x-ray for a joint. Next we have abdominal x-ray. So again, demographics, rotation, inspiration, penetration, always get those marks in, they're easy to get. And then we have the framework that I use, which is A-B-D-O-X, abdo X. So air, bowels, dense structures, calcification, organs, soft tissues, external objects and then include a differential diagnosis as well. There are marks, the way the risky is marked in similar exams is that there are specific buzzwords that you need to be using. So if it is a bowel obstruction, they are looking for words such as central, dilated, valvulae coniventes, small bowel, nil by mouth, and the plan, which would be drip and suck, but you can't write drip and suck, you need to say IV fluid access and um, nasogastric tube insertion. Okay, that's the imaging done. Next we have a referral or a discharge letter. The general template for this is demographics, so name, date of birth, sex, ethnicity, NHS number, address and next of kin, so you need more demographics for this. GP details if they're available, so give the name, some kind of identifier for the GP, um, a phone number and an email address. Then you give the referral de referrer details, so what is the consultant and the specialty in the hospital, and then just go through the presenting complaint as if you're trying to report or summarise a history. So what were the events leading up to them to their admission? What was the onset and the duration? What symptoms did they experience? 
what are the signs and findings, what investigations have been done so far, and what treatments have been done as a result, followed by a plan, so a recommendation for the reader. E.g., I would be grateful if Mr. X could be referred to your care for full assessment, investigation, management, and follow-up. You can then discuss the relative urgency of that too, if it's a very severe case. Next, we have um, medications as well, so any changes that are made within the um, hospital stay have to be communicated on the discharge letter, and any allergies as well. Growth chart. These are horrible, but um, they are actually quite simple when you've seen a few of them. You just don't want to be presented with a growth chart for the first time ever. The main thing to remember is if the baby is born at 37 to 40 weeks, that is term. But if they're before 37 weeks, you need to do a corrected age. So you subtract the amount of prematurity before 37 weeks from the age, and that gives you a corrected age. Um, so the, for another way to say that is that it's the age from the expected date of delivery at 40 weeks or at 37 weeks. So when you're plotting this, you want to plot a single dot rather than a cross on the growth chart and then join the dots and see whether um, usually the abnormality might be that there is failure to thrive. So they might have dropped um, one decile um, or so that yeah, they, they, may, they may have either dropped a decile or they may be growing normally, but um, on, the low, on the low end of what they're expected to. So you then need to interpret whether that is growth restriction or small for gestational age, for example. Next, we have blood test requests. So this is what the form looks like. Probably the most simple question that you can get in terms of filling in the form but it's usually more um, of a clinical question. Someone might present with something and you have to pick three blood tests or five blood tests. And so it can be a bit tough to choose which one is the most, um, most relevant. There are many marks available for clinical details as well. And this was uh, my risky, so I, I actually didn't get any of the, um, this was a mark risky I did, so this was uh, where I didn't get any of the marks to do with um, the clinical details, which is quite important. Hematology. So we have group and save and rhesus comes under group and save if you ask if, if you have something where you might need to ask a rhesus status. The common question will be around tumor markers. So if someone has a mass in the lower abdomen and bloating and it's a female old patient, then you might want to look at which tumor markers would be most relevant to order and you might get five or six tumor markers available or five or six uh, blood tests available. So quick recap, CA199 is for pancreatic and ovarian tumors. HCG tends to be germ cell. Um, AFP is hepatocellular carcinoma or germ cell of the testes or ovary. Um, inhibin, so ovarian granulosa cell. CEA, colorectal carcinoma or mesothelioma or widespread metastatic disease. 15.3 is breast cancer, also 27.29 is a more specific and sensitive test than 15.3. CA125, ovarian tumours, so non-mucinous ones. PSA for prostate, and also beware of false positives if they give any clues in the question that they've just had a PR or they've just um, had sex recently or something that might affect the, the, the PSA. Calcitonin is done for medullary carcinoma of the thyroid and then paraproteins for myeloma and thyroglobulin for papillary and follicular thyroid cancer. For ABGs, um, remember lactate is a separate test to that, so that would use up two of your boxes um, and it comes under biochemistry. Finally, if you're asked to check the doses of something like carbimazole or propothio propothyro-uracil um, as a result of someone being hypothyroid, which is drug-induced, then um, CBZ and PTU are what they stand for. A thrombophilia screen includes a D-dimer, so if you have someone who presents with sudden onset shortness of breath and pleuritic chest pain, then it could likely be a pulmonary embolism, and so you want to include the thrombophilia screen. If you're asked to do a confusion screen, this is an interesting one, and I think it's worth learning this panel of blood tests. So that is a full blood count, because you might be looking for infection, which could cause confusion, particularly something like a UTI. Urea and electrolytes, again, you can justify that um, 
disrupted sodium, potassium can cause confusion. LFT, INR, TFTs, calcium, B12, and folate, um, and hematinics as well if they're anemic. Glucose, um, so if they're hypoglycemic, that will present as confusion. Um, and you can ask for a chest x-ray and a urine dipstick as well. Pregnancy booking bloods. Again, one that you just need to learn. So the bloods are group and save, hemoglobinopathy screen, rhesus status, which is under group and save, and anemia. So you want to do hematinics. Infection includes syphilis, HIV, hep B, and rubella. And then you might do an MSU um, to look for bacteria as well. So that is it for blood test requests. And there we are again, so that's the antenatal screen, so three plus the transfusion form there for the group and save. Transfusion form, so here is an example of the of prescribing blood. So you give it over, say, however long you need to, so say 90 minutes here to give um, each unit, given with 20 milligrams of IV furosemide. In this case, this is because we want to avoid fluid overload in the patient, there may be something in the vignette that says so. Remember to circle um, the correct parts of the question that you're looking for. So if it's just blood, you're giving RBC and um, give a clinical indication. So as much detail as you can within that awkward box um, for why they need a transfusion. So in this case, they've got low HB, so it's below 70, 65. Um, and they've had a recent upper GI bleed with symptomatic anemia. Sign off with your name, your grade, and your signature. Transfusion forms are particularly strict in that if you don't do it all correctly, then um, you are at risk of um, just getting it sent back from the labs. This is the other page of the transfusion form. Relatively straightforward, just make sure that you fill in all of these boxes. You want to take the number of total units that you're requesting and make, make sure to write, say, ASAP if it's an acute situation in the day and time. Otherwise, discuss any pregnancies that you might have been given in the patient history. Excuse me, I've got the hiccups now. Um, in the patient history and um, any special requirements as well. Generally, one unit per hour. In this case, they've given it over 90 minutes for whatever, um, for whatever reason. And if they have heart failure or risk of fluid overload, then you might need to give furosemide as well. Generally, that will be given in the question as well, um, but just keep an eye out for that being a possibility. Death confirmation. So here we have, again, many marks just from the top. Hospital information, patient demographics, date, time. I know it's boring. So then this is the general template. So we have patient demographic, name, time, and and your position, who were you asked to confirm death by and who was present, plus patient location, so where in the hospital were they, were they in a side room, what's the background that led to them dying, and what were the events that led up to them specifically um, going into respiratory arrest, for example. Discuss the death confirmation that you did, so again that will have to be given in the question, but um, a standard one would be listening to heart sounds, for one to three minutes, listening to breath sounds, checking the pupils for any response, listening for any respiratory effort, feeling for a carotid pulse, um, and responding to verbal or pain stimulus. Talk about when the, when the death was confirmed and if you have any concerns as well. So that's my example there. Filling in a death certificate. Again, this is really just filling in all of the gaps here. Just make sure that you do circle these numbers it's quite easy to miss them, um, and also to write the date in full words. There might be something on the left side as well, which would really just be copying the data over from your main certificate onto the left, which gets peeled off and handed over, um, as well as on the right side here too. The other main thing to bear in mind is that everything has to be in words, don't use abbreviations, and also do not put cardiac or respiratory arrest or something like hypovolemia in the disease or condition directly relating to death or directly leading to death. These are not diseases. These are really method. These are modes of death. So 
um, you want to be more specific. So rather than respiratory arrest, you might say pneumonia. Um, rather than hypovolemia you might or hemorrhage, you might have to say ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. And then you can say if there's anything that was that was secondary to anything obvious. And then if not, you discuss or you include any of the significant conditions relating to, but not contrib or, or, or contributing to the death. Sorry. So diabetes type two and hypertension were background conditions that were risk factors for a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. Cremation form. This would be cruel to give to have a cremation form. It would also be a huge waste of time in the exam. I think it would take about 30 minutes to fill in a full cremation form. So I'm not going to go into this in detail. Um, there isn't really any trick to this. It's just about filling in all of the details as you're given. Um, the question will probably be just about as long as the uh, as the answer sheet itself. Um, just remember to be specific and brief um, because you've got a lot of writing here. But I think this is an unlikely one to come up within the risky exam. ABG interpretation. So we're almost there. Demographic. When was it taken? When was it reported? What is the patient background? And then what were the results? Just talk through the results one by one and then circle if they are abnormal and then indicate whether they are high or low, followed by an impression and followed by a plan. So here's an example. We have um, pinpoint pupils and a low respiratory rate with, say, low oxygen, low pH and high PaCO2. So that would suggest that they're in type 2 respiratory failure because they're hypercapnic and hypo hypoxic. Um, and so and they've had a background of opiate use. So you give your impression, talk about the plan. If they've had an opiate overdose, you might give oxygen plus um, naloxone and then ask for senior review. Then write your signature, sign off, maybe GMC number, and then you are done. So that was ABG. Plural tap, bit of a weird one, but quite simple. So state if it's normal or abnormal to start with, give an interpretation and just talk through the components as with the ABG. So talk about appearance, protein, pH, glucose, LDH, and whether it's transudate or exudate. And you can, within each of those, so if there's high protein, you can say, this is suggestive of exudate. Then you end with an impression, possible diagnosis, and if you know, then you can add in a plan as well. Fluid balance. So this is really just totaling up the total input and the total output. This is the form. Um, again, it's more of a nursing paper to fill in, but there's a small, small chance that you get this in the exam. So just be familiar with the paper. You're literally just totaling up the input and the output on both sides, matching it to the time that's given. So when, when they drank it or when they passed that urine and then just write positive or negative fluid balance at the end. And that's it. So with this, most of the marks will come from the balance and the demographics at the beginning. So just make sure not to jump straight into adding up the numbers without putting in all of the relevant patient details. So that's it for the risky. That is a quick run through. That is everything that I did to score quite highly on my risky. And I think you can do exactly the same. Um, give it enough time, get familiar with the paper and just remember your frameworks for all of this. And just remember that it is so time pressured. And so you will need to stay on it. If you're spending any more than 10 minutes per question, just move on, bank it for later. Don't let yourself um, get to the end with three questions to go. Um, and then you've by default lost all of the marks there. Better to just write all the patient demographics down and move on.